गलत में दस दाए हाँ मैं आसुस थी उसे Uh, when I grew up, um, I always thought like I wanted to do something which can touch millions of people, and uh, and I had this deep desire uh, to I don't know if uh, it's an entrepreneur or something to be doing something where I'm more like a self-employed person. Uh, but uh, when I set about um, with my life and my education, I started pursuing chartered accountancy. This is right after my 12th standard. I cleared the entrance exam. So my folks wanted me to be a chartered accountant. Then I thought, okay, maybe I'll be a practicing chartered accountant. So that's how I started my life. Um, I didn't go to regular college. I had to go to uh, um, through a correspondence course because uh, I had to do an internship at the CA firm, which is called article ship in those days, which was mandatory. Either I postponed it by three years, or I had to do it simultaneously. And uh, while working in that uh, accounting firm. I know I learned about business, finance, accounting, also about legendary st stories like you know those in the, those eras. Like it is about eighty-five. So imagine maybe the Ambani stories and, and other such entrepreneurial stories. So this fire within me to be an entrepreneur was just growing day by day. I was able to understand business more from the balance sheet side, revenue, profitability, and stuff like that. But unfortunately, due to family circumstances, I had to take up a sales job after completing my article ship, and uh, I had actually not completed it, partly completed it, and then I took up a uh, sales job in a directory services company, basically publishing phone book directories for the Mahanagar Telephone Company at the time. That was because the that job was far more lucrative. Than an accounting job, and uh, also I like the fact that I had, this gave me an opportunity to meet several businessmen, small medium businesses, and there would be an opportunity to pick their brain. The job was to sell space in the directory, uh, in the categories. Uh, you know, I worked in that company for two years. Um, one of the top performers, so they sent me to Bombay also. So I worked in Mumbai and Delhi. In one of those chance discussion with one of the customers, uh, we we were just brainstorming on this whole idea of information dissemination, and we thought uh, printing directories was like kind of outdated because by the time directories come out, the information change, the phone numbers change, addresses change, sometimes people's product line changes. So we and also to access a directory was a challenge, you know, to find it. It was bulky as well. So we we thought of this idea of uh, how about providing this information 24 by 7 on phone. So basically, uh, we have a large database and keep it updated, and have multilingual operators who could take calls, and uh, it's available 24 by 7. So anytime one could call and seek for information, you get it. And the idea was to provide people uh, information about businesses, and you could either search by business name or category. So what we call it as local search today. Our idea was really good, but then we were way ahead of time. We, less than one percent of India had uh, telephone connections in those days. Imagine um, the response was good. People really liked the idea, but the challenges that we faced was we were not funded, of course, and uh, we had difficulties in getting phone lines even. So in those days, uh, you had to apply for phone lines and wait for years to get a connection. So we would uh, try to buy some premium phones with whatever less capital that we had, and we had a problem challenge of uh, you know further uh, running the business. We had major working capital problem. We had uh, um, you know various challenges. So finally, one day I decided like I was I was not the financing partners, which was all my idea and my brainchild, but um, I felt bad for my. Financing partner was I, I suggested to give my shares to him and move on with life, you know, because by then things had come down to a situation where we couldn't take care of our own needs. So there's a question of if you can't fill a fuel in your bike, then you can't reach out to work. So it was as bad as that.
Unfortunately, by then I became the sole breadwinner for my family. Also, it was a very tender age of 23, and 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 I lost my dad. I had three siblings to take care of, and uh, coming from a very humble background, we actually lived in rented apartments. We didn't have any family savings or insurance, so basically, it was for me to think more about how to survive and how to take care of the needs of the family. So I said. I cannot anymore flirt with doing this kind of a business, which is not earning money for me. Uh, so I said I would rather do something. Either I go back to taking up a job, or I kind of uh, probably do uh, some other kind of business, which which would definitely give me some positive cash flows and some way that I can take care of my family needs. And this was uh, when I thought of a new idea called wedding planner. Now, um, the, the idea was simple. Like um, in India, people used to spend a lot of money in, on weddings and building a house. Basically, you save up your entire life to just spend on weddings and building a home, and that's apparently a dream of every Indian. So that that's when I thought, like, okay, this is one sector. Acha, we had seen a. Major economic uh, uh, upheaval in those days, uh, 92 almost the government had to sell the gold to kind of salvage out of the situation. So at that time it made sense that okay, go and choose an industry which is like kind of inelastic, which is does not depend on any of these vagaries. Despite all that, people will still continue spending on weddings and all that. So that's how we thought of this wedding planner, which was basically giving information about from from a pundit to honeymoon, anything to do with wedding. So we would uh, publish this uh, um, colorful magazine, um, which was uh, biannual, and we'll distribute it to free to the uh, the classified advertisers of Times of India and Hindustan Times. Actually, we approached both of them and we gave an opportunity to one of them, being in Delhi at that time. So it had to be Hindustan Times, and that's how we took off. This was a uh, um, first business that made money for us. And I, I was able to take care of our needs, but the problem here was the meeting of minds. We were not, we were different people. With, we were three partners and it was not going anywhere. I just went, felt suffocated. That's when I decided like I should move on from this and go back to my old business. Ever since that I quit, ask me, I would still dream of doing it all over again. I would dream of millions of people just using my service and it, it was like, uh, because it was quite evident when we ran the business, it was, the need was there and, and it was, it had the potential, it's just the ecosystem wasn't existing. So I had to say, okay, I have to wait for the right ecosystem, the right time and I have enough capital when I can start all of by myself. In 1996, I I could sense a bit of change in the ecosystem. The government has liberalized telecom uh, at that time. There were many private operators. The, the public uh, operators had gone into um, much better capacity. You didn't have to wait for years to get phone lines. I said, this is the right time to start the business. And that's how, with this dream of starting this big, large company where I could employ thousands and touch the lives of millions of people, I went to one of the uh, and, and managers of the Mahanagar Telephone Nigam with the story that look I have this bright idea and in those very pre-internet era you know so um, I realized while running ask me that people were familiar with our name but when it came to the number they wouldn't even remember the number so invariably people would meet in a social gathering and say oh what a brilliant idea by the way what's your number I said wow <laughs> this is it so we're supposed to help people when they are in need and we don't have a number which they can recall. So I said, next time ever I do it, the number should be so popular. People should say, by the way, what is the name of the business? So that's how we started it. And we we went to the manager and pitched for this number, uh, a vanity number, which was all eights, uh, seven times eight. It was it is next to impossible to get something like that because people use a lot of influence, including reaching out to the politicians to get these things. But it was by chance or it was destiny, I don't know. I kind of pitched this to the manager and he looked into my eyes and said, look, I think I see a lot of dream in your eyes and you seem to be very sincere and it's going to help people and I'm going to give you this number. And that's how the story started. This was in 1994, 1995. So for one year, 
I didn't have the money to start the business. So although I have the numbers, so I had to apply for the phone lines. I had to t take at least an office on lease. I had to work on the software from basic scratch. I had to work on the database. So I engaged, uh, um, you know, a lot of school, college students around the area and would send them with evaluation forms to go around the city and collect information about businesses. And I took a one-man coding. We had a one-man coding team and I would write the uh, pretty much the algorithms in English, basically the logic behind the search and what exactly we required. And this one-man uh, coding team was to uh, get the, we got the job done. By a year, uh, we were almost ready and uh, coincidentally that was the time when the, the new phone lines also came and then when finally we started our office with a rented place. We wouldn't have money to even, uh, you know, buy our own computers, so we rented computers, including the network cables to the, the chairs where rented from the local chair rental sh shop paying two bucks a day. You know, it was like that. It was a completely very humble beginning. So we don't have money to go to the market, to go to the users, but we still have to build this business. So let's do one thing. Let's let's focus on execution. Let's say, what are we going to do? We, we People are looking for information. They should get it for free and should be fast and it has to be accurate. So we we focused on building this free, fast, accurate um, uh, information uh, uh, through on over the phone, and and uh, that needed a lot of a lot to do with the uh, search capability, the way the data was structured, and also training of operators who could disseminate the information in the shortest possible time. So we cracked it, and I was one tough customer to please. You know, if it could crack me, I said, okay, this is going to work. Let's not go to the consumers directly. Let's go to the businesses. We would go to every business owner and tell him, look. Your business listing is here on this. You would like to make some updations. Uh, you can add, you can uh, delete, uh, or whatever you want. You can even test it. And if you want to buy something, use this because it's far more efficient. It will give you many choices. And that's how the initial set of users were the ones who could potentially give us the money to. So they were the businesses, the business owners. We did a math, okay, if we, if we do for every 10 demos, we could get one conversion. We are sailing. We'll be able to pay our bills at the end of the month. And uh, that kind of worked. The first lot of guys who went demoing the product to businesses and uh, that gave us a conversion. Now, here we started making surpluses. We could pay our bills and, and we realized that we had a few thousand bucks left. So we said, if this is going to be with, with, with 10 guys we did this, why not increase the sales force to 20 and then 30 and then 40? So then on, we went on increasing our sales force, improving our product, and, and, and then with each of those surpluses that we deployed back into the business, initially focused on expanding within the city, and then we spread to various ports of India, like Delhi and Bangalore, and everywhere we would take very humble offices, um, you know, pretty much everything rented, uh, including the computer systems. And that's the story. That's the story of Just Style, how we started it. This is um, like, despite all odds, we kind of started uh, uh, building a very successful business because it was like day one profitable, cash flow positive, more importantly. Now, uh, that really gave me the confidence. Like, I don't need capital. I don't need outside help. I don't need partners. Now, I can continuously ask, so, so long as I manage it well, I keep my focus. And I decided on uh, one of those days, like, if I ever have to be successful in my life, in, in my business, in whatever I do, I need to just keep my focus on my product and my customer. If I get that, those two right, I will get everything else right. So since then, we have been uh, f focused on our users, our consumers, our customers, and our product. And that's why you would see that JD is one unique company which has evolved over a period of time so much that it is difficult to recognize the current company from what we were uh, before. Now, when you focus on your users in, in, in our context, you know, um, um, you are fully aware of the ecosystem, fully aware of what he is, how he is evolving in, in his way of doing things. When we did a um, um, voice in, in about 99, 2000, there was a lot of noise about internet. And generally, people would bump onto me and say, hey, your kind of business model will not succeed now because the world is going to see internet. Uh, mm, you must think of something else or, you know, uh, switch to an um, internet model. So I started working. I registered my domain name in 1997. 
when most Indians had not heard about internet at that time. So when we had this domain name uh, justisle.com in 97 and I engaged one, uh, um, one guy who could really help me build his first basic uh, website and we struggled a lot and, and internet connections those days were not, I mean it was like pathetic. You would dial up, uh, a dial up network would pretty much last not more than two minutes. Uh, so I would wonder how can this world dramatically change when the, the, my office internet was not even functioning. But around 99, the, the noise was getting bigger and then that's when um, I was approached by a few consultants who said, we can help you raise money in your business and you can give an internet story to this. Um, I wasn't convinced, you know, but one, one Indian entrepreneur based out of the US uh, was pretty successful. He said, I have this great vision of starting an internet company in India. I have it already. I would like to have your company also come on board with us, we'll merge the companies together. I said, look, I don't believe in this internet story, but why should I do it for, uh, you know, unless you're paying me uh, something. So he said, okay, I'll give you my dot-com stocks, you know, we can swap it. I said, sorry, I don't believe in these things. If you are putting cash here, I may, I might. Uh, he said, fine, what's going to be the valuation? I said, I don't know, you come with the valuation. So I went to my chartered accountant and asked him, what should be the, what should be the value of my company? He looked at my balance sheet and they said, probably 15, 20 lakhs of rupees. I said, okay, I don't think I'm going to sell anything if that's going to be the value. And here comes the, the offer. Uh, this guy came with this offer of $2.2 .2 million or something like that. Uh, $2.2 million, $2.3 million, I said. Uh, then it was a shock, but I had to hide it. And then finally I said, look, uh, I would probably do this deal at $33 million and then two, I would not, um, uh, he said, I would do, okay, pot cash, pot stock. I said, no, I would probably sell pot cash now. We can do an agreement such that you said you will be listing in NASDAQ soon. We can, we can complete the deal when you get listed in NASDAQ. So that's how we, so in 99, a guy who started from scratch and were nothing in 94 when I came to Mumbai with no money and I had like $1.5 million in my bank. I felt like the richest man in the world. I said, that's it, I don't have to do any more work in my life, I just uh, want to be, uh, I, I want to take a look. Okay, by the way, that, that other company failed, um, so they invested and within six months it went bust. So finally, I decided like I need a sabbatical, I need to take a break from work because I, I started very early with my articleship and uh, in my teens and, and taking all those family responsibilities and all I said, I won't take a sabbatical for a year. And uh, I took a break from work. I, I traveled the world. I did yoga, meditation, all kinds of spiritual stuff. And finally, I thought I want to be a yogi. I don't want to do anything else in life. Um, it went on for, I extended my sabbatical by another six months. And finally, uh, I one day, uh, sometimes too much of happiness can be boring also. So one day finally I decided, no, I'm, I have to go back. My place is here, I know, and, and rebuild my business. So after the sabbatical, I decided to come back to business and that was in mid-2002. And I took stock of the uh, I work in the business environment, I, I realized that, uh, um, you know, the pleasant thing was like the mobile penetration in India was growing. Even then, there were about 90% of Indians didn't have telephone connections in those days, but it was quite evident with the mobile uh, penetration, the way it was growing. I was quite sure that most of India would be covered through this uh, uh, wireless network and finally we decided to ride that wave. We did many experiments, many improvements in our products and like, um, uh, when you're answering calls on phone, it takes minutes to answer a call because sometimes the user does not know what he's looking for. If he knows, then he would say, I don't have a pen, pencil ready, you know, I would just uh, wait, hang on a minute. So there was a lot of unproductivity and unnecessary expenses. That's when I thought, like, how do I cut this cost and improve productivity of the operators? So I said, okay, fully automate this and start sending information by text and email and, and, and don't read out information anymore. So we built this great uh, software which would just go and push, uh, push it by text and mail. Yeah, it's a big deal in those days. Uh, when we were so thrilled, oh wow, this is going to be really be 
appreciated by our users and, and when we went ahead and implemented it, it was a disastrous outcome. Like 85% of the users said, I'm not going to call you again. This is not customer service. You got to read this now. You're not going to send me by mail or SMS. And then, um, then the whole thing was disheartened. They said, no, we got to roll back to the old uh, uh, flow. And uh, that's when uh, I thought like, you know, well, I use it, I like it. Why would that be that people don't, wouldn't like it? So I said, we have to kind of force this onto the users. So one day I decided, look, you're going to tell the users that we have moved on to a new software. We cannot read, the, read anymore. We cannot read out the information. We can only way we can do it by sending by text and mail. And that's what we did. And uh, there was a lot of complaints. People said, grudgingly gave their mobile number. In those days, people used to call from the landline number, but they would own a cell phone. So, uh, so they got, and within a week, it became so popular that so popular that people started raving about our service and saying, oh, before I could even keep the phone down, you guys send the text message. I've not seen anything like this in the world. You know, those kind of compliments came. And that's how we realized, and, and we, you know, uh, one stroke, we brought down our cost by one th uh, to one third of what it was, or rather improve productivity by 3x. Having uh, employee productivity increase it by 3x, reducing human error. So when you send it by text and email, there's hardly any human error chance, reading out or listening and stuff like that. So it was a must do for us, so we went ahead and did it. For us to go online was actually um, a big decision because Justile by then had established itself as the, the only sole player in the market who's been immensely successful. And there were a lot of wannabes who wanted to start this business. The challenge for them was they didn't have the content to begin with. Even uh, so, the, the, for us, if JD goes online, uh, the biggest challenge for us is, of course, the cannibalization of traffic, Monetization on online was not that well known, so obviously we lose out on monetization, which was pretty good on our, our, over the phone. And then, of course, this data getting exposed to the world. Then we had threats from Google's of the world. We had threats from wannabe me, small players who wanted to start this business, or somebody funded only want to play the online game. And but um, although the team was not so in favor of it, but I said, look, if we don't do this, the world is going to change. You know, so if we don't do it, someone else will come and disrupt our model. We'll only postpone it by a few more years, but then it is definite that if we don't change, we'll learn. So we took that decision. We had challenges as expected. With a lot of people who whacked our data, copied it on and had their own versions of local search. And the giants, we were not sure whether they're helping us or they're actually in a way, sabotaging, or not sabotaging, I would say. In a way, they were also curating some content, so they had a basic good start, and, and, and there was all those things happening. Hindsight was a good decision, because uh, today we have like 30x of what it was in the number of users. We decided we must have a completely plug-and-play, cloud-hosted solution, where any business who wants to compete in this environment with the online players, uh, the best way to do it is because your customers are moving online, so you can't ignore online. You need technology to run the business. You are, and also, uh, over and above, if you can manage your inventory, you can control your pilferage. If you are running a grocery store, for example, if if the it, it keeps track of your inventory, it can auto place order to Procter and Gamble or HLL. You know, like uh, you know, there's so there's no um, situation of displeasing a customer, not having a product and stuff like that. So we went and built that product, and we're rolling it out next month. Uh, and uh, that's going to change the way people do businesses. And it's a very low cost plug and play, use any device kind of a model. You can use a PC if you want, you can use a laptop, you can use a tablet, you can use even a tablet or even just a mobile phone. And uh, you can have the highest end of barcoding and we can help you with uh, all kinds of things that is required to run the businesses and gives, gives you complete control. Then we went meeting investors. It was like we were profitable, we were growing. It's like we didn't require anything. But that whole sense of validation from somebody like a venture capitalist would be great. So I went about meeting investors in India and abroad. 
uh, the outcome was really bad. Uh, they just didn't understand the business model. Google had not become popular then. Google was just getting there in 2004. They went public, and they became immensely popular after they went public. Uh, so uh, people did not understand search, the potential of search, and how exactly investors could make money there. Um, and then, uh, oh, then I, I decided, okay, we, we really don't need these guys if they don't believe in us. Like, forget about it. Till then, we were more growing, like adding more people. Um, and things were much more um, related to the number of people who worked and all that. We didn't try to monetize better in our product. In fact, it was it was pretty much like a socialist system. Like, you know, there are ten dentists in a locality who would charge all of them the same amount and and the names would go in cyclical, so everybody gets equal chance. One day, one customer walked into a Bangalore office, and he had a bag full of uh, cash. And he said, uh, I, I, I want my name to come first for the moving services. And here is the money he, he, he offered us. And that's when we, we said, no, no, we have values. We are principles. We're not going to accept uh, something like this. He said, OK, in that case, you take some more. And, and, and he said, this is, I'm doubling the amount. It kind of uh, occurred to us, oh my goodness, there is so much more opportunity in this business that we must have vanity positions. We must have rankings. And that's how we can monetize it better. And uh, we quickly accepted the cash and thanked him for what we learned from that uh, event. And then we introduced premium positions, um, you know, you know, you cannot have a Googleish kind of a uh, bid based model for small medium businesses because they like stability, they like uh, to plan their resources, uh, keeping in mind the kind of leads they can get, the walk-ins they can get. So uh, they needed more uh, kind of a assured kind of a period where they would get a certain position on so many leads and all that. So we came up with our own version of uh, um, um, a market-based uh, model, but uh, we, we kind of decided that the pricing engine that we built will take into account the demand for a keyword and the traffic and the area that the business wants to target. And over a and it has self-learning. So as it uh, kind of um, you know, sees there's more demand, the prices go up. So initially, we were doing it uh, manually. And it was an extremely difficult exercise. And a lot of um, you know, decisions were, went here where sometimes we overcharge people, sometimes we undercharge people. The moment we build the pricing engine, then things change dramatically. So there comes the nonlinear growth. You know, then we realize the very same businesses who were paying pittance to us are willing to pay 20x, 30x now to get onto their top positions, and uh, and and that's when we kind of uh, figure out the bell. Thankfully for us, the business grew um, more widely, word of mouth in those days. Although there was no social media in those days, I, if I have to launch something like that today in this era, it would just take only 12 months to reach that millions and millions of users. Uh, but though back then it was more word of mouth, and so we kind of uh, became the household name uh, uh, in India when it was a question of searching and finding some local information about a business or a product or a service, people would immediately call was just style. So um, we capitalized on that, and then we continued to grow our business. In 2006, we had this peculiar situation where our uh, earlier investor wanted to uh, wanted an exit, actually. And I said, look, we tried our luck with venture capital, it didn't work. So what I could do is probably list in the, as a micro mini cap company in the Bombay Stock Exchange. Uh, we engaged some bankers, and uh, we were almost on the verge of listing. And, and there comes a private equity, uh, um, you know, SAF partners. They walk into our office, they say, hey, we like your uh, company. We kind of used our pro your services. Uh, can we know more about you? And uh, one, one evening, they met us, and they were so thrilled. They said, uh, can you guys come over to our hotel tomorrow morning for breakfast, and we can sign the term sheet? And, um, and they were willing to do a flexible deal where there could be a part exit for the uh, earlier um, you know, stakeholders. And uh, they wanted considerable stake in the company, so we kind of accommodated, and the valuation was pretty decent. Um, you know, it's about $60 million on that then. So we thought, like, wow, that's a cool deal. 
And uh, uh, so that's, that's the fastest ever deal they've done. Uh, and, uh, and then on, um, within six months, we had this hedge fund, hedge fund from uh, New York, uh, Tiger Global. They, they came, um, in fact, Chase Coleman himself was in this office, and I remember in this very conference room, and uh, he and his entire team, and uh, they said, uh, we would like to invest in your business. After hearing our story, I said, look, well, I don't need the money now. Maybe next year uh, we will. Uh, we said, why not now? I said, no, if we at all be raised, it will be at the double the valuation. I said, no problem. We'll, we'll, we'll put the money at the double the valuation. Then I, I said, uh, well, um, but then we are getting into the internet space. We are not even sure if we will be successful. So I'm a bit, uh, maybe I'll wait till that, you know, we see some signs of success. He said, we are big boys. Don't worry. We won't hold you by your neck. And we won't invest now. Then I said, in that case, no due diligence, because the earlier KPMG due diligence was painful. Now I'm not ready for another due diligence. So we don't want any due diligence. <laughs> Here you go. So that was very encouraging. You had years of um, running the business. There was nobody to look at your business model. And um, you know when you tried hard, it didn't work. And when you do great work, when you do good work, and there are people out there, they hear about you, and they come to you, and then they're willing to value it many, many times more than you know what you're worth it, uh, worth at that time. And that was an incredible feeling, you know. So we had all the money. We 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 need not complain about money. Individually, also, all of us made some money. So we then said we have to build a world class, uh, you know, search business here. You know. In 2008, um, with this global meltdown, overall disturbed environment, we also, with the overhang of a lot of, uh, you know, raising money and all that, somewhere we lost sight on our business. And, you know, things started slowing down. And, and I couldn't believe this business could slow down. And um, we were growing, but uh, much lower. Um, in one year, we were like growing at 27% when we were growing the previous year, probably at 55, 60%. It was quite a appalling, shocking thing for me at that time. And then I, 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 in fact, my investors had doubts in my capability. They kind of hinted indirectly to me that uh, perhaps we have to find another CEO to run the business. And you can always play the founder role. And, and uh, so that hurt my ego. I said, come on, money, you have to, you have done it in the past and you have to prove them wrong. And I said, look, guys, give me six months time. I will, I will completely turn it around. And if I don't, then of course you, you have the right because your guys are invested in the business. And that's when we, I, I, I got back into the business focusing more on the revenue side. And I realized that the way we were selling the product was not the right way. We need to bundle web, voice, and all of it as one product rather than selling four different products like we were trying to sell differently. And uh, that decision helped. That simplifies the sales process. That simplified the pricing mechanism. That simplified, in many sense, the simplification actually helped us monetize better. Revolutionary change, I would say, because we had a model where people were prepaying us. We would collect upfront money for a year and then render the service for uh, the period of time. Now, I, I thought about uh, this, okay, if I were the customer, I don't want to be part of just style. If I'm a doubting customer, then there's a good chance that I may not be part of JD for many, many months or weeks or years to come just because I don't believe in it. If somebody allows me to taste a service, maybe I would, if I like it, I may just continue with them. So, uh, I, and then the other thinking was like, okay, if you ask people to pay upfront so much money, there are more bikes selling because there are EMI plans, more television selling by EMI plans, cars are selling. How, how would people being part of JD by paying on a monthly basis? And that's when we decided to offer this uh, advertising opportunity on a pay on a monthly basis. Um, team didn't believe in it. Obviously, their incentives were aligned with the collections and, and, and overall they felt that, you know, uh, well, I can't take the fact that somebody signs up and a couple of months later they don't pay. Uh, I would rather have all the money up front. So it was quite an effort. It took me months of efforts with the team. And finally, I, I had to come with a policy that every new campaign you sign up, we're going to call up the customer and ask him, did you know about the monthly payment plan? 
And if, they, if he learned that uh, he does not know about it, then you lose your job. Like after two, three warnings, you lose your job. Now finally, the fear in them, they finally went ahead and uh, explained that to the customers. The business grew like a hockey stick. It's like this, you know. And uh, uh, so the uh, cash registers were ringing. The, the profitability of the company went up. Productivity per employee went up. Immense customer satisfaction. And people were willing to spend more money uh, now uh, because they don't have to pay advance, they had to pay monthly. So, and it was a V-shaped turnaround. So the team management team was happy, uh, the, the board was happy, and then finally uh, we continued. And then in 2012, we thought like we should, um, now it's the time we should go public. Now before that, we did our web version. When we launched the website, we learned a lot from that also. Initially, it was about free, fast, and accurate information. So it's okay, how do you structure, you don't get bother much, you know. It's all about a text message going to the users. So when you launch the website, we realized that no people actually on the web, they like to see rich content. They will like to see maps, directions, you know, images, uh, videos even. Um, and so we, we worked on those and we learned a lot from that and we enriching content, going back to businesses. They wouldn't understand that. We would, we would employ our own videographers, photographers to get those content clicked on their place and they put it up there. Um, and then we, uh, we also, um, around that time, we kind of figured that, uh, you know, there's a need for social integration, more to do with reviews and ratings. So if we just run a search engine, local search engine, without user reviews and ratings, there's a chance that um, someone else would start a, a new search where it's all about reviews and ratings, and then we might lose out to those um, new players. And Yelp was getting very popular in the U.S. So when we introduced the user reviews and ratings, and the bigger worry was like, uh, what do we do with our paying customers? Do we have reviews and ratings for them, or do we just block the reviews there? Then obviously we had to have it, because we run the business for the users, not for the advertisers. Advertising is incidental. So we decided, like, the, no, the advertisers will also be rated and reviewed by our users, and, and there's a good chance that sometimes the advertiser is not getting a very good rating or review, whereas a freelister is getting all kinds of possibilities, whether we said, same user focus, nothing else, and then everything falls in place. We went ahead, took a decision, and a lot of uh, challenges we faced, but we went ahead. Today, JD has more than 55 million user ratings and reviews, and perhaps the largest in terms of unique ratings of human beings in, in any site. So the number of people who have, unique number of people who have rated businesses in JD is far outnumbers most others. If we can integrate um, uh, the address book with our reviews and ratings, then we may be able to tell these very same users their own friends' ratings. So we can highlight their friends' ratings there, you know, and um, that's when we, inspired by WhatsApp, we kind of integrated with the fo uh, phone book and we could uh, show the reviews by, so if you search for a restaurant or a doctor, uh, you may find some of your friends have rated those uh, uh, listings. So obviously, the belief then was like if it is reviews and ratings are of course is um, easier to stay forever but then people would like to believe more their friends and family than strangers and that's how we kind of did it. Our first attempt to go public we had a great road show uh, and uh, uh, investor response was pretty decent. But unfortunately, the stock market here was down the dumps. Uh, rupee was tanking. Then uh, around the same time, Facebook had gone public and that stock tanked. So we just, after a good roadshow, we came back and the bankers said, raised their hand and said, look, we can't go public now. The doors are shut. Window is shut. Now you may have to wait for some time. And uh, that was painful. That was really demoralizing. But uh, we kept at it. Uh, in fact, one of our investors took that opportunity I said, hey, you guys wanted to raise money. Um, What's that? You want to raise that at this valuation, 10%? Okay, here is my check. I put the, all the money for you. You guys run the business. Don't worry about going public. So the money that we had to raise into the company was raised. So that was like a consolation prize for us. The media used to write really uh, nasty about our uh, uh, IPO because it was rightfully so because there was no... No IPOs happening at that time. They said this is probably will get undersubscribed, may not see through the day. 
uh, and we had to give a kind of innovative way of to do the public. Uh, so for retail investors, we said there's a money back guarantee for six months. So if the stock tanks below uh, uh, with a price, you know, they get their IPO price at least. And that was guaranteed by me as a promoter of the company. And uh, we did that. And uh, well, then of course it was history. Um, that stock was oversubscribed some 12.7 times. And um, it is one of the best performing IPO stocks in recent times for the last three or four years. Uh. So post IPO, um, uh, you know, the thought was like, what next? You know, when you are an entrepreneur, you have these milestones and then you get philosophical also at that time. There's one bit of joy but then if you, uh, you enjoy that moment, but then, and there's a seriousness that about what next, you know, uh, because again, you have to live up to your expect, expectations of people. The bars are getting raised now. And uh, that's when I thought deep about our business. I said, I think the way the internet world is going to shape up for the future, it is going to be not just finding things, but actually transacting. So JD as a search destination, uh, should transform to a search plus transaction destination. We as a business have been enablers for uh, other businesses. So we empower, enable other businesses. We never wanted to get into someone's business, but we definitely as a platform, I thought like we should allow all those listings that are listed with us to have some kind of a transaction, transactional feature which, which the users will appreciate when the time to come. Coincidentally, around that time, I see, I, I saw, noticed a lot of dynamic changes in things around me. Smartphones were getting extremely popular. My wife, who was not a very big internet user, um, you know, she she started subconsciously using internet all the time because she was using a smartphone and constantly communicating uh, with her friends using mess using social um, like sites like Facebook, WhatsApp, and uh, I found that uh, very interesting. I said these people are going to subconsciously get into doing things online, like using an app. So the JD app has to become a JD search and transaction app. So one day casually asked my wife, uh, I saw her generally struggling with a lot of things, multitasking, fixing appointment with the doctor, ordering some groceries or medicines and, you know, restaurants. I said, look, if I give you one app where you can do all of this, you don't have to call anybody. You just have to go in two clicks and three clicks, you can do it. Your restaurant orders, you, your previous order is saved, so you just go and repeat order, just sit done. How would you like it? She, she said, this is the first time that you made sense in so many years of our marriage. Um, um, she was really excited about it, and that was a big inspiration for me. And there was none in the world to compare and say, oh, I want to become like this. I said, no, this is going to be the way. I'm going to please my wife. That's it. <laughs> and shape up the product. So... Uh, that's how we came with this idea of search plus transaction. Now, when you think of search plus transaction and in the space that we operate, we deal with millions of businesses. There are more than 15 million businesses listed with us. 300 odd thousand pay businesses are paying us money to be part of Just Style. Now, I need to have the right technology and create the right platform and motivate these vendors and these businesses to participate and thereby win the confidence of the consumers and they're all um, dependent on each other, you don't know where to start. So it's a typical story of supply, demand, demand, supply. And uh, that's how we started the first version. We said, okay, first look at all those where you can have immediate API integrations and say, for example, travel. People were earlier calling up travel agents and booking tickets. Now they do it online. So try to get all those where you have ready APIs available, get the integration done so at least people can experience a part of the transactions there. Then on, get others like the doctors on board, the grocery stores, the chemical medic medical stores, and the, the restaurants, the you know, ordering food from a restaurant or booking a table in a restaurant or buying products like uh, you know a television or a mobile phone. We decided what, is, what should be our way. Now, the market was more about deep discounting, you know, 
it was slightly different, you know. I mean, it continues to be even now uh, a lot of indiscipline, cashbacks, you know. I'm not a big fan of those because I don't think that's a good role model for the country at least because this is not the way that you are, I mean, uh, doling away cash to people and uh, in the process nothing is getting built accordingly. Uh, so I, I decided, look, let market businesses compete with each other. Let's provide a platform and we'll discover the price. If um, these prices are not as good as the prices sold in the e-commerce uh, entities, uh, let it be for some time till it comes to a point of evening out. So that's how we went about. So now you can find any, pretty much any product, uh, um, you know, basically all the branded products. And uh, you can, uh, we haven't yet launched the app. We would probably do it by the end of uh, July this year, this month or by August. We are in no hurry to do it actually. Uh, but uh, you would see that uh, the product that we launch is a one app for multiple purposes. And the effort is to see that your experience is not compromised, your price is not compromised, and uh, the time is saved for you. So, and also you give your card details, your personal details to one place and, and you can do multiple transactions, which means you, you can not just only order food from a restaurant, but you can also do a laundry pickup through us. You can also have uh, a product bought and shipped at your uh, this thing and it was like few clicks and, and doing it. Now as we go forward you would see that you know we would want to integrate because as I said once again we are focusing on the user. So as a user if you want to buy a mobile phone you would definitely want to check few sites to find out where is the best price. So we decided JD as a marketplace should provide the prices of leading e-commerce sites as well. So when you search for a mobile phone, soon you would be able to see the prices from leading e-commerce sites as well as your neighborhood vendors. So you get to choose from them and uh, decide. So this is truly empowering the user. So this is the way that uh, uh, we would be moving uh, forward in our uh, approach to, uh, um, you know, as a platform, as a marketplace. Uh, because the user is a focus to give them the best value. The other challenge was to get the vendors who are uh, small, medium businesses, the level of technology that they were in. The challenge there was they weren't organized. In fact, many of them couldn't even manage the inventory well. There were challenges of pilferages. So one, you don't know what is inventory, so you would probably not be able to match. Uh, or, you know, uh, it was a lot of manual thing involved there. So one is that, so you, you, is there, was there a way to give them a piece of technology through which they can manage their inventory, billing, barcoding, and publishing in third-party sites like JD, and also uh, integrating with third-party logistics. Finally, have a, a small dashboard available on a device like a cell phone where they can see by the minute what is the revenue sale in their shop. If you go through the story of Chastal, if you see the way we, um, it, it may seem for an outsider when they think about our business, you know, currently keeping in mind that the ecosystem is, there are so many different players, so many vertical players, uh, each one uh, trying to be a specialist in something. And here is a company which is a horizontal player, which is continuously evolving, trying to be relevant to the users and to the businesses and competing with all others. Now, so far in, in our business, we have, we have had no competition. Uh, there are a couple of hundred companies who try to emulate us in different parts of India, some national level. They just couldn't survive because we understand users better, we understand customers better, and we are extremely good in execution. And uh, we are always at it, you know, so th that's a key of ours. And we don't get distracted. So any kind of valuations, this uh, thing happening there, that company, this thing doesn't affect us at all. In fact, I keep telling my team, like, keep away from newspapers. Don't get, you just keep your focus on your business, on your customer and your product. And that's how you build this uh, uh, thing. And this culture would continue. And as you see, maybe five years from now we'll meet and we would have, we would all gone ahead in our journey and you would say, oh, I recall you were there, you know, back then doing this. So one learning was like, uh, um, you know, for example, as I said, uh, our brand was very popular, but people wouldn't know the number to dial. 
So one learning words like uh, keep your focus right and, and of course brand is equally important. In that case, we didn't give Im uh, enough attention to get a vanity phone number. We just settled with any number that came our way. And then when, when I started the next time around, the number was such that one stole, you will never forget. You know, it's like a easy to remember number. So that's one. Two is to be frugal. It's important to, if you, you would take the story of any successful entrepreneur anywhere in the world, they will all be a garage story. They'll all be a very simple story. Most of them will be. And that is super important. And that's where, where you have been immensely successful today. That uh, is, is because of that frugal approach to uh, business. Your, your focus should be always in your product and your user base. But focus does not restrict you from scaling. S you must think of scaling when you can leverage the current resources and strength to newer markets. So my concept of focus is I will never take my eyes off my product and my customer, my users. But when it comes to, say, to trying out new territories, that is definitely one of the things that I should do to grow my business. When you are a startup with no capital, you settle down with any talent. You make the best of what you have. You know, so um, what I did was, of course, my experience in sales and also in finance. That was a deadly combination, actually. You know, a couple of years in, um, you know, in doing auditing for businesses and then a couple of years in hardcore sales, like, you know, cold calling and field sales and all that. So I learned a lot about the way people, businesses think, how their minds are wired, what goes in their mind. And I kind of could, I would have the training programs conducted myself. I would teach them about how to uncover the needs of, uh, and, and make them feel that how important it is to, for them to be part of just that. And that kind of worked. So we keep saying change is only constant in, in JD and, and we have also been fortunately in a business where change is like absolutely a must. And uh, the way we think about these changes is as huge opportunities actually. We love changes. We love the better penetration of internet today or um, your smartphone um, proliferation. We, we love the fact that there is, there is a company that's talking about um, uh, um, 100 million internet users in 100 cities in 100 days with 4G connection. We love these things because this is going to further help us uh, reach out to our targeted audience. So if you keep your focus, the humans are your customers, so you keep your constant focus on them and constantly evolve with time and change, whatever they become and you modify your business and you continue to be relevant and fashionable. First, you must know whether you are an entrepreneur. Just because uh, there is a talk about entrepreneurship, there is access to capital, I don't think people can become entrepreneurs. I have some more feeling that entrepreneurs are kind of born. You know, especially, you take my case, I'm, I come from a non-entrepreneurial family. For hundreds of generations, our family worked for someone else. We never, never, never nobody had the courage to work for um, or start on their own. Uh, but I had this deep desire from an early age to become an entrepreneur. But you would also see that people who come from entrepreneurial families, they kind of naturally learn entrepreneurship. Probably, there's a general discussion in the family while having dinner, they discuss about you know, business, so that's how you learn it. Uh, so that deep desire is important, and deep desire to do something unique and different is also equally important. And then if that desire is there, then you have the right passions in place. You'll be able to overcome challenges because there's no, and then there's a lot of hard work in entrepreneurship, you know, especially when you bootstrap and start on your own, you have to double as a CEO, CTO, CFO, everything uh, yourself. So those kind of things that you need to understand and then take the plunge. Mm -hmm.